Well, what's going on, River City Church? I'm so glad you're here worshiping the Lord with us today. Jesse and I are in Amarillo, Texas right now uh, for my father-in-law's celebration service. We're celebrating his 38 years of ministry, his leading Victory Church as the senior pastor. You know, we have a transition that's going to be happening. Uh, officially, we'll be prayed over in January, and these two churches, both River City Church and Victory Church, are becoming one. We're going to be one house multiple rooms, one church, multiple locations. I believe that it's the will of God. And uh, I want you just to, just to pray for us, continually pray that we as a church together, that we would be led into the perfect will of God. And, and I wanted to talk to you today. I wanted to talk to you about the time of year we're in. And I wanted to talk to you about winning the war for your mind. You know, we're in a season here in October where there's all sorts of monster stuff everywhere, right? Uh, next week, it will be Halloween. Uh, we're not celebrating Halloween as a church, but we're having a candy fest, a candy trail where the kids will come and have a massive time here on the property. You want to be there. There'll be bounce houses. There'll be candy. There'll be a big time for all of our kids. The house of God ought to be more fun than any party in the city on any given night. So come out for that. But when you drive around town right now, you can't help but notice that the monster stuff is in full effect, right? It's always like that in October. So I know going down Frederica, I was driving down Frederica the other day, and there's a house in the middle of town that's got this creepy ghost-like girl swinging on a swing. My kids like squeal when they go by it and look the other way. There are big spiders out, inflatable spiders. There's cobwebs everywhere. And, you know, it's all the monster theme. That thing's flowing and going right now. I don't know about the rest of you out there, but I was raised in the era of the slasher movie. I remember Freddy Krueger and Nightmare on Elm Street, right? Jason and Friday the 13th, part 27. You know, we, we watched all of those Jason movies. And that Michael Myers is so hard to kill. You know, he just keeps coming and coming and coming. There are all these monster movies. Even I remember being a kid, I remember Chucky, right? The little doll. It's always creepy when you take something that should be innocent and make it like, like uh, if they take a movie and they take a kid and they make the kid demon possessed or something like that, it always makes it that much scarier because it flips what its natural thing should be. Chucky should be cuddly, not a killer. Uh, so you see all those monsters, those things get your attention. I remember being a little kid. My mother would not let me watch scary movies at all. But mom would leave town and I would be there with my father. And I'll never forget, we watched Stephen King's It when I was a kid, the first one, that killer clown. I didn't sleep for like a month. I remember sitting with dad and he's like, don't tell your mama, I'll let you watch this. So we got all these ideas of monsters that are scary out there. And it, we always think that there's something on the outside, right? That's the way a monster movie works. There's something on the outside trying to get in to hurt me. But the biggest monsters we really face in life, they're not Freddy, they're not Chucky, they're not Jason, they're not Michael Myers. Come on, the biggest monster you'll ever face is not the, the monster on the outside trying to get in. The real enemy is the inner me that we have to get control over to live a successful Christian life. Let me say that again. The real enemy is the inner me that we have to get, get control of if we're going to live a successful Christian life life. Come on, everybody say the inner me. It's the inner me is where the monster is. And it's true of every person. Today, we're going to talk about how do you, how do you take control over those monsters that spin around in your thought life? Some of you have a monster that tells you you're not good enough. Some of you have a monster that tells you you'll never measure up. Some of you have a monster that tells you that your marriage won't work, that your kids won't turn out right, that you'll never have enough money or enough success or enough whatever it is. That's the enemy, the inner me that has to be put under the authority of Jesus. And I'm telling you, you can retrain your brain to think the thoughts of God. Romans chapter 8 verse 6 in the NLT, this is the New Living Translation. It talks about this story, this, this mind monster, if you will, that comes after all of us. Nobody is exempt from this. I'm telling you from the greatest minister of the gospel in the world, to Mother Teresa, to Billy Graham, to every person in this room, you have to deal with your mind if you're going to live the life God intended you to live. Here's what it says, Romans chapter 8 verse 6 in the NLT. It says, so letting your sinful nature control your mind leads to death, but letting the spirit control your mind leads to life and peace. Let me read it again. So letting your sinful nature control your mind leads to death, 
But letting the spirit control your mind leads to life and peace. Talks about our sinful nature and the way it works with our mind. See, the real enemy isn't out there somewhere out where. The real enemy is working against our mind. And there's the sinful nature. We have two different natures. The Bible talks about it. Paul talks about it. Uh, the King James Version and probably New King James Version, some of the older translations will call it the flesh. Paul talked about the flesh. And the flesh is our sinful human side. It's what it is. Then there's the spirit. We have the flesh and it's at war with the spirit or the sinful human nature versus the, the new nature that Christ gives you, the spirit of God. There are two different natures and we get born again, right? Whenever you get born again, your spirit man is saved. If you're out there born again right now, somebody say amen right now. You're, you're born again, right? If you can say amen to the fact that Jesus is your Messiah, you're born again. Now your spirit immediately got saved. My spirit's brand new when I, when I get born again. The moment I put my faith in Jesus, man, I'm not going to hell in the future. I'm going to heaven. The moment I put my faith in Jesus, all of my sin is remitted. It's removed as far as the, as far as the East is from the West. The Bible says the moment you believed on Jesus, man, your, your sins were cast into a sea of forgetfulness, never to remember by God again, my spirit's born again. So then, but here's the deal. Whenever I got saved, my body didn't perfectly line up. You can look at my body right now. I mean, this is close to perfection, but it's not all the way there. You know, I'm playing, but you, you know what I mean. Uh, our body didn't immediately get changed. You know, the Bible says you're going to have a glorified body one day when you get to heaven. What is it going to look like? I don't know. Uh, but it's going to be it's going to be full of the glory of God. We get to heaven, we're going to have a glorified body. You know, I, 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 I feel like I'm going to be uh, taller when I get to heaven. I'm going to be like some of you tall guys. I'm not going to have love handles. I'll eat carbs and they won't count. Come on, somebody. I'm going to I'm going to I'm going to I'm going to walk and not grow weary. I'm going to run and not faint. I'm going to eat carbs. They won't count. I'll swim in ice cream and it won't matter. I'm going to have a glorified body. Uh, hair ain't going to come off our heads and grow out of our ears and our backs. We're going to have a glorified body in heaven, but we don't have it today. Wouldn't it be awesome if the moment we gave a salvation altar call and people believed on Jesus, that their bodies were brand new? Man, I'll tell you, it'd be easy to get people in the church if we get a glorified body right here. It doesn't work that way. So you got your spirit gets saved, right? Your body is, is, is still, this world's working on this body. The Bible teaches we're three parts. And the third part is really your mind. So you have spirit, soul, and body. Spirit is the eternal part of man. Soul is your mind, your will, and emotions, and then your body that you're in. And here's the deal. If you're going to win a successful, uh, if you're going to have a successful Christian life, and if you're going to win, what you have to do now is you have to get a majority working in your life. You've got to get a two-thirds. You've got to get your spirit and your soul lined up against your flesh. Your body wants to give itself to the sinful nature. Two-thirds is a majority. Come on, our spirit's born again. Now we have to train our brain. We have to get our soul lined up. Not let the monster take us out on the inside. We need to take the monster of our mind, the sinful human nature, and we need to put it under the authority of the Word of God, put it under the authority of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. We need our brains washed in the Word of God so the mind monsters won't win. Anxiety's not going to win. I'm going to tell you feeling of worthlessness, it's not going to win in your life. All of the lies of the enemy are not going to win, but the word of God is going to win in you. Somebody say amen. Here's the deal. You have to look whenever you have thoughts rolling around. Is it a mind monster? Is this something I need to feed or is this something I need to starve? You got to identify the monsters, right? That, that's, that's part of a monster movie. It's always part of a monster movie. The monster starts showing up, weird things start happening. But right, you don't know what's doing it at, at first. And then finally, somebody, typically the hero, all these movies have the same plot. Typically the hero in a monster movie will identify that monster first. So lots of times it's somebody you don't expect. It's a kid or it's somebody, uh, you think about uh, a silver bullet with Stephen King years ago. It's the kid that, that's paralyzed from the waist down. You make him in a story, in the plot, an unlikely hero. So when he wins and he kills the monster, it's a bigger victory. So what happens is these guys identify the monster. Telling you what, you have to learn to identify the monster that's coming for your mind. Right? What thought is going to help me? What thought is going to hurt me? What thought is the sinful nature? Letting the sinful nature, the Bible says right here, control my mind leads to death. 
Your thoughts can literally bring death into your life. The sinful nature running amok in our life can bring death to pass. So I have to look at my thoughts and I have to figure out which one are monsters. And if I got a monster running around in my mind, I have to, I have to put it under the authority of Jesus. Come on, don't let that monster have its way. Some of you, you, you worry about so much. You worry about things that could happen. You worry about what if this happens? What if that happens? What if this happens? You worry about things that are never going to happen to you. So you have to worry about it now. And then if it happens to you, you'll have to worry about it then. You'll worry about it twice. See, a lot of people have never learned to identify that monster. They have a negative pattern in their brain. I believe this, that you cannot live a positive life with a negative mind. You ought to write that down. I cannot live a positive life with a negative mind. See, the sinful nature brings all of the negative thoughts up. All of the things that are contrary to the Word of God brings it all up in your life. You have to identify that. You have to see it and name it for what it is. And then you have to fight against that idea that's running amok in your brain. Um, thoughts are like trains, right? They're, they're going somewhere. A thought is like an airplane. It has a final destination. Trains, planes, or cars. You, you typically wouldn't go to the airport and say, I want to get just on any plane that's here. Where's it going? Well, I don't know. Uh, going to Canada, going to Haiti, going to Toledo, going to Japan, going to Florida, going to California. Uh, you, you wouldn't just go get on any plane. Why? Because you're concerned about the destination. See, unlike we wouldn't just get on any plane, a lot of times we get on any thought. We let a mind monster come and we get on a thought. I see Christian people all the time. They'll get on a thought and they let that thought begin to keep growing. They ride that thought. And come on, our thoughts are taking us somewhere. How do guys get themselves in trouble? How do people get in affairs? Well, they get on a thought, right? Somebody walks by in the office that's looking good. They see somebody at the restaurant that's sharp looking or maybe a guy's paying a lady some attention. And, and, and a thought, the devil always works through thoughts. It starts in the mind. The devil's after your mind, right? Then a, then a fiery dart of the wicked one. The Bible says we raise up the shield of faith with which we can quench all the fiery darts of the wicked one. So that thought comes to your mind. And, and the thought is not the sin. I know all of us out there, we think crazy things sometimes. I'm not going to tell you, I have crazy thoughts at times. And I'm like, my thought just scared me. I don't know, any, any of y'all, you probably won't admit it, but have you ever have a thought, it's like, what's wrong with me that I'm thinking that? Well, that's not a sin. That's a fiery dart from the wicked one, right? He just threw that dart out there to see if you would bite. It's a mind monster coming at your mind. And if you get on that thought and you ride that thought, that thought's like a seed that starts to birth in your life. Here's what, here's what thoughts do. Thoughts, if you ride on them long enough, that guy sees that, that lady outside of his marriage or that lady hears that. It's typically she hears that guy. Women are attracted by words and, and, and attention. Men are typically attracted visually. So they see that, they hear that, that thought starts to germinate. They start thinking about that person, right? And then, and then they, they, they make an action towards that thought. See, thoughts become actions. My thought is going to become my action. I'm like this a lot of ways in life. Like, I'll start thinking about something I want. Jesse makes fun of me because I'll be like, you know, I need a new pair of shoes. I need some shoes. And she'll look at me and she's like, you're going to have shoes before the sun goes down. Why? Because I'm thinking about that. That thought comes in my life now becomes an action. I go and I buy a pair of shoes. Oh, here's the next thing. Some of you ladies, you got that action where you go buy a pair of shoes. See, actions become habits. Some of you buy shoes like every day. Come on, how many of you guys, you got a wife out there, you can go into your closet and it's like the shoes are breeding and multiplying in the closet. And it's like rabbits in the closet. What are we going to do with all these shoes? And then you'll walk into that closet, look at all your shoes and say, I don't have any shoes to wear. I mean, it, it's crazy, right? See, that thought became a ha an action and then an action becomes a habit. All right? So our thoughts become actions. Our actions become habits. Somebody runs and they get on that, that, that brain train or that brain plane. And they keep following that thought. It becomes a thought. Then boom, now we have an action. You do an action enough, it becomes a habit. And then our habits become our life. Our thoughts will become our life. 
That's why you have to kill the mind monsters, not let them rule us, not let them control us, not let them have the best of us. I'm telling you, you're not going to have the wrong kind of thoughts in Jesus name. You're going to start nurturing the right kind of thoughts. You're going to put the wrong kind of thoughts under the foot of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. You're going to have the right kind of thoughts. You're going to have the right kind of actions. You're going to have the right kind of habits, and then you're going to have the right kind of life. That's what I declare over your life. See, if we can control our thoughts, we can control our life. I really believe that. Now, I'm not saying we're 100% in control of everything that's around us. But come on, I'm talking about the whole song or the nature or the tone of our life. You can control the tone of your life by controlling your thoughts. See, I've never seen anybody that lets the sinful nature rule over their mind that long term, that really became a significant player for the kingdom of God. Kingdom people understand so much starts in our thought life. They don't let negative thoughts rule their life. They don't let thoughts that are contrary to the word of God rule our life. We begin to control those thoughts, control our soul. David said this about his soul in the Psalms. He said, why are you cast down, O my soul? He talks to his soul to control those mind monsters. One of the most powerful things you can do to overcome a negative thought or, or a negative emotion is you have to begin to use the word of God and put it in your mouth and speak to that thought and put it in its place. David was feeling down. He was all down in the, in the, in the grubs and he, he, he felt like nothing was going right. And so what does he do in the Psalms? He starts talking to his soul. He says, why are you cast down, O my soul? Why are you disquieted within me? Hope in God. I'm telling you, sometimes you just need to talk to your soul. Your thoughts going weird and you stop and you say, thought you're going to line up with the word of God. Why are you cast down? Why are you bummed out? Why, why, why are you giving yourself to your feeling? So you're going to line up with the word of God. I do this to my soul. I'll have some days where my, my mind, my will, my emotions are running the wrong direction. And so I get on to my soul. I'm like, soul, you're going to line up. You're going to think right. You're not going to be depressed. You're not going to be down. You're not going to be full of anxiety. You are a child of the most high God. You are a son of the king. You are born again. You've been bought with a price. You are the apple of God's eye. You are the, you are the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. You have a greater one living on the inside of you. He that is in you is greater than he that is in the world. You have an anointing of the Holy Spirit. You, you are a covenant man. You're a friend of God. You have an inheritance. You're going to heaven. You're, you're a voice of God in the earth. Why would you be depressed? And if I attack those thoughts with the word of God, those thoughts begin to get smaller. If I let those thoughts go, those thoughts begin to get larger. See, here's what it says. It says, it says these things. It says uh, in that, in that uh, passage in Romans 8, 6, it says, letting your sinful nature control your mind leads to death. The mind monster wins. But letting the spirit control your mind leads to life and peace. If I let the negative nature control my mind, I have death. It's a mind monster. But if I let the spirit of God control my mind, you have to learn to control your soul. Control your mind. Come on, you're going to control your mind. How do I control my mind? Well, what I feed it. What I feed it. It's really massive. What am I thinking about? What am I focusing on? What, what, where am I feeding my mind? See, this world's always going to be trying, the world around us. I know that you work at places and you're around negative people all the time. I know that you're there with the guys and girls at work and a lot of their conversation isn't godly. And I know you can't just run from that. You're going to be in the midst of that. But I'm telling you, even in the midst of all that noise around you, you can control your soul. How do you do it? Well, I'll give you an illustration. I, I, I've traveled to preach quite a bit. And so I'm on airplanes, right? Uh, going to preach here, going to preach there, coming back. It's part of what preachers do. Uh, preachers, that they get a voice that's a part of their life. And, and nobody likes being in an airport. And nobody likes being in an airplane, right? You're in a tin can. You're surrounded by people. I literally, I got on an airplane the, the other, uh, this has been six months ago or maybe a year ago, and I get on an airplane and I go walking back and there's two seats where I'm going to be set, setting. Now, at the time, I'm a guy that weighs about 260 pounds then. Come on, I'm thinner now. I'm going down to 225. But I go walking up to the seat and there's a guy sitting beside me that I promise you, he was the size of an NFL offensive lineman. He was, he was probably 200 pounds heavier than me. 
And this guy was sitting in his seat and then a third of my seat is how wide he was. And he looked up at me and I looked down at him and we're like, oh Lord, this is going to be a long ride. And so I got in my seat in this man's love handle. He and I become, become attached to one person. And you're talking about an hour and a half of misery in this tin can. So you're hearing everybody around you, right? There's somebody behind you. You're trying to nap. They won't be quiet. There's somebody in front of you that's talking about things you don't want to hear. You're sitting in a guy's love handle and it's sweating. And we're getting we're getting they're kind of kind of becoming one uh, uh, one entity, me and this guy. But the only thing I can control right then is I can pull out a set of noise canceling headphones. Right. I can put those noise canceling headphones on my ear and I can tune the world out. Right. My environment didn't change. I'm still in the same place. I'm still in the tin can. I'm still sitting with the guy and his love handle. I'm still got an hour and a half to ride, but now I'm listening to worship music or I'm listening to teaching. I'm listening to something else. And so what am I doing? Instead of letting the situation control my mind, now I, I, I've chosen to cancel out those negative sounds and that negative environment. And I got something positive coming into my life. And I'm telling you, if you just learn in the spirit to put some noise canceling headphones on and, and even listen to something positive in your car instead of the world, you, you listen to something when you're going to work in the morning instead of the world. Now you can cancel out the noise of this world and tune into the noise of the spirit. I'm telling you, you are going to tune in to the, the voice of the spirit instead of the noise of the world. And God's going to do something supernatural in the midst of you. You're going to shut the voice of the mind monster. And you're going to listen to the right voice. Come on. When we listen to the spirit, what's going to happen is we're going to have life and we're going to have peace. I declare the peace of God's coming to you because you're going to listen to the voice of the spirit. See, here's how Paul said it. Paul said this. He said these words. He said in Romans chapter 12, verse 2, he said, and be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Paul said that Romans 12 too. Here's how it says it in the NLT. It says, don't copy the behavior and customs of this world, but let God transform you into a new person by changing the way you think. Don't copy the behavior and customs of this world, but let God transform you into a new person by changing the way you think. See, our mind gets in ruts. Uh, they even teach that. That your mind has a way it's used to process information. It has a way it's used to uh, taking things that come at you in life and process it and make it all work. And the mind literally gets ruts, ruts of behavior, ruts of thinking that we slide into. It's how the mind monsters come on. It's how the, it's how the anxiety comes on. It's how the thinking things are going to be bad. That pattern of thinking that says, man, I'm never going to really become something in life. That's a rut. It's been trained into our minds. And a lot of that is the, is the lifestyle of the world. The Bible says this, don't copy the customs of the world. See, don't be conformed to the world in our thinking. See, the world has a way it thinks. The world has a way it acts. The world has a way it communicates. And a lot of Christians really, because they haven't been trained to train their brain, they copy that stuff. They get on that stuff and they have a rut in their brain that drives them a certain way all the time. Man, you don't, you don't want to be, you don't want to be uh, uh, just a cheap imitation of the world. It says, don't copy the world. Don't walk like the world walks, but let God transform you into a new person. God wants to transform you into a new person by renewing your mind. In 1998, I tell this testimony a lot, but it helps people so much. Man, I walked into a church, Victory Church in Amarillo, Texas, the one our church is merging with. And I thought like an addict. I thought like someone who was a victim. I thought like someone who could not overcome. I'd been conformed into the world system. I really had. And I, I, I'd conformed to the way the world operates. But I'll tell you, I got free from all those things that bound me. And some people think, well, did you get free because God just saved you and it was all over and you were just absolutely perfect the day you got saved? No. You know, I got saved and I still got drunk after I got saved. I got saved and I still got high after I got saved. I got saved and I still did all the stuff you're not supposed to do. I still had cussing fits after I got saved. I kept doing those things until I retrained the way I thought. 
It was a process of renewing the mind. I think a lot of times we tell these uh, uh, miraculous transformation testimonies, and I'm thankful for every one of them, where somebody just gets delivered and boom, they're out of something that's destroying them in, in one moment. Uh, I think we tell that testimony so much that we discredit and discount the way God works in a lot of lives. He works in a lot of lives, little by little, bit by bit, piece by piece, retraining the brain and changing the way you think. Don't be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Listen, if you've got mind monsters riding you, I'm going to tell you God can change the way you think by retraining your brain with the Word of God. Right now, sitting in this sanctuary, listen to this message. I'm telling you, the Word of God's coming into your mind. You're, you're becoming different right now. Your mind is becoming stronger right now. Your brain is lining up with God's Word. And because of that, you're going you're gonna to change your life. You're going to become a new person. That's what it says in the NLT here. By changing the way you think, you change your life. You want to change your life, change your thoughts. If you want to change your situation financially, change the way you think about money. If you want to change your health long term, change the way you think about your body and taking care of it. All, all of this stuff, it all starts in the mind and then it goes into the life. So listen, God's already saved our spirit, but now we got to train our mind and not let those mind monsters get the best of us. Come on, I want you this week to focus this week on how am I going to train my brain? What am I going to do? What am I going to focus on? Here's what I want you to do. Here's three ways you can train your brain this week. Very quickly, I want you to follow this. Number one, you can train your brain by getting up in the morning, 6.30 a.m. You can get on River City Church's Facebook page and there'll be people praying the word of God right there. Man, listen to it. Pray with us for five minutes, 10 minutes if you can. You, you might be able to stay on the whole 30 minutes, but if you start hearing that word of God every morning, Monday through Friday, it'll start to train your brain. You ought to go to that page uh, um, tomorrow morning, Monday morning at 6.30 and let the word of God begin to train your brain. One of the second things you can do is you can start a Bible reading plan. It's very simple. Get the Bible app, download it on your phone, the Bible app. And there are many different Bible reading plans you can start. Finding a way to consistently wash your mind with the Word of God every day. You might read one chapter a day. You might read uh, three or four chapters a day. I don't know where you're at in your reading. But, but make it where you can do it. Make it sustainable. Make a decision to start reading the Word of God little by little, bit by bit. You know, the more I read the Word of God, the more I listened to Bible teaching, the easier it became to overcome my hangups in life. The easier it was for me not to want to fall into old habits. It's still that way today for me. I'm telling you, things happen in life, right? Life's going well. Something happens that, that makes me angry. And, uh, you know, I'll get focused on something like that for a while. Maybe, maybe get uh, un unforgiving or bitter on the inside. You know how I deal with that? I have to go back and retrain my brain with the Word of God. And I think you got to do that all the days of your life. Now, I'm telling you, getting up in the morning and opening up the Word, letting the Word hit me first. I love this. Pastor Jordan out in Amarillo, what he does before he'll let his feet hit the ground in the morning. So he reads something from the Bible before his feet hit the ground. Why? He wants to retrain his brain to think the thoughts of God. So you can get on prayer. Number two, you, you ought to get a daily Bible reading plan. Number three, number three, I'll give you four things. Let's make it four. I started with three. Now, number three is you ought to listen to Christian teaching, right? You, you find something. You're in the car so much. We're all in the car so much. Instead of just using that as time that doesn't matter, come on, let's use that as time to learn something. You could listen to your favorite preacher, Brian Gibson, on podcast right there. I'm just kidding. There are lots of good guys teaching out there and there's teaching around. So you get that, begin to begin to take those podcasts, listen to them, those Christian voices, let them begin to shape your mind. And number four, I'll tell you what's powerful is listening to worship music. Come on. I don't listen to worship music just all the time. I don't want you to think I'm, I'm just in there living in a Hillsong or, or a Bethel concert continually. That's not what I do. I like other types of music too. But there's something about turning on anointed praise and worship and focusing on that and letting my mind focus on Jesus instead of the problems of our world. I think as we magnify the Lord with our, with our worship, listening to worship, here's what it means to magnify the Lord, right? What the mind monster wants to do is make you think about the problem, think about the past, think about the failure, think about the sin. 
Think about this. Think about that. So you start magnifying your problem. You're looking at your problem. What does a magnifying glass do? It makes something larger, right? The Bible says to magnify the Lord. I believe as we worship, we begin to magnify the Lord. Whenever you worship, you magnify the Lord. You're taking your focus off of the problem and you're getting your focus on the promise. I think a great thing for us to do right now is to magnify the Lord together as a church this last song. The worship team's already on stage and they're going to lead us. Come on, let's magnify the Lord together before we get out of here today.